pleasure to cordially welcome you uh, to today's lecture. Um, it's again in our UFG Peaceful Change lecture series. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, today Professor Eva Neumann, uh, who's going to talk to us about performing statehood through crises, citizens, strangers, and territory. And um, um, I printed out uh, Eva's uh, um, CV. It's uh, double-sided. Um, it is uh, the number of publications is numbered. I think it stops at 304, no, 370. <laughs> um, no, uh, jokes aside, he's really a fantastic scholar, um, referenced very, very, very widely. Uh, I came across uh, his work first time when I was uh, a graduate student, and um, there was this, uh, this, there were a couple of books that he wrote on the uses of the other. Uh, so how, how Europe uh, um, demarcates, delineate, delineates itself from its significant others, which I, I thought were already very, very inspiring. And, um, and then he did a lot of other things as well, uh, super interesting. Uh, some um, very, very conceptual. Um, so we attended on, on Tuesday a, a conference on world order. Um, uh, some uh, really very much about the, the micro mechanisms, uh, especially of diplomacy. I should add to this as well that Eva has not only been uh, a fantastic scholar uh, for many years, uh, but he also uh, had his stunts uh, as, a, as a diplomat uh, himself in, in the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. Um, so when he writes about diplomacy, uh, then he actually really knows what, uh, what he's talking about. Um, he also won lots of prestigious prizes. I'm not going to go into all of that. So uh, maybe just, just one, just one. Oh. The, the International Studies Association, so they have a lifetime award, the Rosenau Award and everything. He won it uh, very well deserved. Uh, so I'll stop there, um, but, but in short, we really have a, a fantastic speaker for today. And, and Eva, I'm really, really looking forward to your talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I. Uh, I always get a bit sort of, I get the cringe when people start sort of uh, introducing me that way. I always wonder sort of, who is that person, you know? Um, but you, when you start talking about prizes, I understood what the game was because uh, today's host just won the prize for the best book on diplomacy and I was the runner-up. So I think the, what was invited now was a co hearty congratulations to you, Marcus, for winning this prize. <laughs> And it's good to be here, uh, particularly since I now understand that you may uh, actually face lockdown. So uh, I found the window, which is uh, a good thing to find, particularly for diplomats and people studying them. Um, today's title is fancy. Uh, the argument is not really that fancy. Uh, what I will try to get across is that uh, st crises may be bad for some people, but they are also a very nice opportunity for states to uh, do what one of the things they do best, namely to demonstrate how cool they are. So that's the long and short of the talk, and the rest is just extemporation and, uh, and uh, explanation of that one point. Um, so, when we talk about crises, two points that should come in handy. One is that uh, the stuff that causes a crisis is socially made. That does not mean that it's not real. It's very real indeed. But if you take any crisis, uh, there is an intensivation of the political going into it that makes it a point of a security crisis or some other kind of crisis. Some of you may be familiar with the work of the Copenhagen School of Security where they talk about securitization. If it hadn't been for this terrible uh, linguistic squib, we could have called it crisisation or something, because it's about sort of deciding that, all right, this is so bad, now it's a crisis. And this is historically contingent. I will go into humanitarian crisis a bit, for example, in the uh, paper, and uh, uh, there was no such thing as humanitarian crises as we know them before the end of the 1800s. The first one was probably with the so-called Bulgarian horrors, where European public opinion was outraged about what happened in Bulgaria, where the Ottoman Empire was basically spearing away um, Bulgarian citizens of all ages and genders. And uh, this was 
the first big outcry in the world that where you could talk about something like a humanitarian crisis as a transnational phenomenon. So today we have humanitarian crises all the time. Something has happened. So there is something historical about how social crises are being produced. This is changeable. It has changed before, it will change again. Crises come with, it has a temporality, and a temporality sim simply means how humans experience time. They have a beginning, they have an escalation, and then they are either diffused or they turn into something nastier, war, for example. Um, crises have been studied sort of thoroughly. Um, and uh, uh, it's particularly been studied what actors do and how that impinges on other and what other peoples do and how those two things will play together. Uh, our host's latest book is about that, a very welcome addition to the literature, about the co-managing of crises and what that does to actors and how actors are actually interacting on the strength of their alliance modes and other modes. So uh, it would not be too much to say that you've been hanging over the shoulder of the statesperson to find out what's going on, their motivations, etc. Um, the work I'm presenting today, which I did together with a friend and colleague called Ole Jakob Sending, um, is about, I'm, I'm trying to prod further along these lines, I'm trying to find out what is a crisis as seen from different parts of the state apparatus. You know? um, because if you look, if you open the black box of the state, as American political science uh, says so fancily, that means if you look at different parts of the states, they think about different things as crises and they handle them in different ways. An example, over the last 10, 15 years, childcare in Norway has become a, a cause of crises in bilateral relations with India, Morocco, Poland and other countries simply because childcare in Norway involves the state taking away kids from their parents more often than it happens in these countries, and there's a tiff. And the local childcare people in Norway, which are of course part of the state, they're paid by the state, they're manning and womaning a, uh, a social apparatus that is part of the state, and they think very, different, very differently about international crises than, for example, the foreign ministry. To be more precise, they don't think about it at all. They do their job in a town. They sort of take away a kid. It turns out this kid is a Turkish citizen. Turkey, represented by their embassy in Norway, protests. The Norwegian MFA, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, comes in, and there's an international crisis, all caused by a part of the state that didn't think about it. So the, ans the, ar the first question we ask in this paper is simply um, what are crises as seen from a foreign ministry, in this case the Norwegian foreign ministry. Why the Norwegian foreign ministry? Because it's the country we know best. Right? Uh, so what we did was we went in and we had a look. We both worked in the foreign ministry and we asked people in a pre-study, as they say, um, how do you think about crises? And we identified three different kinds of crises as seen from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. One of them I've no noticed already, humanitarian crisis. That would be a situation anywhere in the world which is so bad that something has to be done. A typical example, the ultimate example, I would think, would be genocide. But there would be other things as well. You will recall the phenomenon of humanitarian intervention that happened during the Cold War. Vietnam, Uganda, etc., proliferated after the Cold War. And you will recall that a body of humanitarian law formed in the 90s and early 2000s. You will recall the, the, the R2P, the responsibility to protect. All these things are institutionalizations of an idea that if a humanitarian situation on the ground, anywhere in the world, regardless of in which state, uh, escalates too much, it's a crisis that all states have responsibility to do something about. Now, that's a humanitarian crisis. And I hope now that I mentioned the Bulgarian horrors, I mentioned the Cold War and the end of the Cold War, that you see that this is a socially produced phenomenon. Right? Some of us are all for it, others are more reticent. Right? 
That's one form of, of crisis. Another form of crisis is what diplomats call civilian crises. Is it Zivilkrisen in Germany, or in German, or what is it? It is when, when certain citizens of a state are scuppered somewhere else. Uh, some of you will have had my fate. Uh, you've been on interrail, and suddenly you have no money, and you need to go back to your state. You don't want to engage in theft or prostitution or any other sort of quick way of making money. So you go to your embassy and say, what do I do? I'm a Norwegian citizen. They said, here, son, you know, here's a train ticket for you, and you pay back later. Now, that's not a citizen, uh, that is not a civilian crisis because it's, it's fixed then and there. But if it escalates, I'll give you a, I'll give you a bang example. Uh, in the Christmas of 2004, there was a tsunami that, uh, that actually was sort of wreaked havoc. I think something like 40,000 people died. And most of those who died were people who were at the very seaside when this tsunami came in. And who would those be? Those would be fishermen that don't know about tsunamis, and it would be rich tourists who would be living in the best hotels. There are certain disadvantages to being rich, so the numbers of, of people dead amongst tourists would come from... I mean, let, let us just put it this way. Scandinavia and Germany were overrepresented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, some 90 Norwegians were sort of missing, right? So this was not only a humanitarian crisis, it was a civilian crisis. And it was a wake-up call, and I'll come back to that. But first, I want to introduce the third kind of crisis. You've been waiting for it, security crisis. Now, that's the real McCoy. I mean, this is the crisis that we all love, know, and I hope not so many of us love. Uh, it is when uh, you have a uh, gunboat flotilla right outside your capital, or when you're being invaded by military means, or when something that threatens the... Um, the integrity of your territory and the state's integrity is afoot. So, the first point here is that um, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has set up an institutional, well, it's formed an institutional setup that is that three different kinds of institutional setups for these three kinds of crises, and they are rather different from one another. And if we go to so-called neo-institutionalism, we will recall that, uh, that uh, uh, how things are organized will impinge directly on what the outcome will be. That's the gist of, of neo-institutionalism. Is that Lu you, Luca, behind that mask? Yeah, hello. <laughs> It's terrible. To, uh, there is a Verfremdungseffekt to these masks that is absolutely horrific. Uh, all right, uh, that's by the way. Um, in the case of the tsunami, you know, in the, in the Christmas of 2004, uh, Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Germany were all caught unawares. They hadn't expected this kind of scale of the civilian crisis. And they were all criticized up and down and back and forth for not having been ready. The Norwegian consul in Phuket in Thailand, for example, uh, thought that she could go home on a Christmas break uh, as this tsunami also broke, as it were. And she was, of course, roundly criticized and uh, got it in the neck, etc., etc. As you will know, there is nothing like a crisis to instigate organizational change. And this happened in this case. The Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs haven't been soundly uh, criticized uh, in an official report, responded by setting up a crisis center for citizens abroad, and that this center is manned 24 hours a day and can be called from anywhere in the world. This was a neologism, right? New thing. And this is not just a Norwegian thing, because when diplomats want to do something new, one of the first things they do is to confer with other diplomats. And in this case, the first thing the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs did was that they checked with their like-minded countries what do you do when it comes to crisis management. And they found out that they didn't do anything either, so they had to do this thing on their own. 
and then there was sort of back and forth between the diplomatic services. If you've ever wondered why ministries of foreign affairs are so similar, it is because that is intended. They confer with one another as they come up with neologisms. Right? And so too in this case. So you have a, uh, you have a, um, a civilian crisis center, I said for 24-7. And I will quote the chap who was in charge of it when it was set up in 2005, 2006. He describes what it does as follows. If the duty officers smell the situation, that would be some citizens being in a TIFF somewhere in the world, she would call me. I would then set up a conference, part real, part virtual, to assess if there was a need to call a staff meeting. It is more like a task force, but we call it staff. We have a specific protocol for how to set staff. Typically, a conference would involve the relevant embassy, the head of the regional department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the head of the consular section, the head of the communications division. I would then advise the secretary general, that is number one on the bureaucratic side in the, uh, in the, uh, the MFA, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, what the Brits would call the permanent undersecretary, to set staff. This advice is always heeded and is on average given about five or six times a year. It happens that the political leadership will enhance a no staff uh, uh, advice to a staff situation, but that happens once a year tops. We built a situation room and have perfected the uh, standard operational procedures which give us a wide berth. We also have an MFA team ready at all times to support the work of embassies. It may be deployed on a 24-hour basis, consists of health, police, and military personnel, and is activated perhaps once a year. We leave it to the embassies whether and when they prefer to set staff themselves. They do drills once a year, so all of this is, not, is now institutionalized. A key problem is flow of information. We have come to trust a software program called Crisis Information Management, where you are given one of a number of different codes, you log in and read the incoming information yourself. It minimizes the use of telephones and unlocks time. Now that is a description of a rather mature way of dealing with the crisis. It's hands-on, but it's also rather new historically. It's from 1905-1906. Now, if we look at how a Ministry of Foreign Affairs is rigged for humanitarian crisis, it's very different. There, you will typically have a, an organization element. In the Scandinavian countries, it would be a uh, this humanitarian section. The section is part of a department. The department is part of the ministry, right? And these people will release tranches of money to typically to UN organizations. Uh, and they will release other money to NGOs, non-governmental organizations, like Save the Children, for example. Uh, Norwegian Red Cross is another one. I'm sure you have them in Austria as well. And they, these international organizations and the NGOs will do the work. So typically, if there is a hunger catastrophe in Tigray, to take an example, um, the Norwegian foreign minister can go on TV this very same day and say Norway is contributing. And why can she do that? Because the tranches of money are already there in the UN and there are specific uh, sort of standard of operational procedures that will release the money if a situation is graded as a crisis. And in the Norwegian case, they even have three degrees of crises. So the, 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 the bigger the crisis, the more money is released. Right? Now, this is a very different uh, way of, uh, of setting up uh, how to deal with a crisis than is done for civilian crises, because it's not hands-on at all. It's actually hands-off. Everything happens remotely. Um, and one of those people we interviewed complained about this. He said, it's a bad job for a diplomat to sit and be a tiller. I mean, that is a a cash sort of oper operator, as it were, or operating a, a, a cashier, operating a cash sort of ding, tsh, out comes the zone, here is the money. Right? So he was personally miffed 
that uh, the work he did as a diplomat was not really hands-on in the field at all. It was sitting and being an accountant, basically. But the crisis is solved right? this way. Now, when it comes to security crises, of course, the setup is different again. The organization then uses this same uh, staff center that was set up for civilian crises, but it's rigged in a very different way, and everything is done together with the Ministry of Defense, which means that it's handled in a very different way. Um, there are a number of things, and uh, Sybil, maybe you could uh, bring on that, uh, that uh, sort of table that I, I brought. There are a number of things that would differ between these three kinds of crises, partly as a result of, uh, of um, how things are organized and partly as a result of, um, of how, um, how people think about them. And this is where I'll be returning to, uh, to, uh, to uh, how crises are performed. Have we lost the... All uh oh, right, okay, goody. Um, in that case, uh, we will do it the old-fashioned way. Words are mighty as well. Um, so, if we look at how a state will actually tell narratives about the crisis, that is when we start thinking about performativity. Uh, let me put it in this way. If you work anywhere, if you work as a student, if you work as a bureaucrat, if you work as a diplomat, there are certain things you have done again and again and again and again. Right? Taking a break, for example. When I was a student, a break would involve you stopped, you had a cup of coffee, you had a cigarette, you chatted to your fellow students, it was supposed to take 10 minutes, but it took 30, and then you, you continued. Right? Now there is no cigarette, but you have specific, everybody knows if you say, let's take a break, it's not like, oh, what's that? You know, how do you do that? You just do it. Right? It's a socially recognized way of doing something that can be done well or badly. That's a, that's a practice for you. Cleaning your gun is a practice, right? Um, if you have one, that is. Um, and if you've been trained in doing it. Uh, now, practices have to be instantiated. They, they have to be performed. You can do a good break or you can do a bad break, right? You can have a good break and you can have a bad break as well. Um, so this could be a good lecture, it could be a bad lecture. You know, I've been practicing this for 40 years, so it should probably be a good lecture, but you never know, right? I'm performing. What does that mean? In the literature, there are two different ways of reading performance. One is as a theory, as a theater thing. You know, I go up here, I come, I, I watch my cuffs, you know, I sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the audience, I'm sort of making my body language work, you know, I'm... I'm an actor, basically. Right? I perform in that sense. That's a standard way of thinking about it. It's a good way of thinking about it. Post-structuralists, though, have this idea that I'm instantiated by my practices. You know, it's a little bit like uh, I'm asleep the rest of the time and suddenly I come to life and uh, I exist as an individual and when I don't perform, I go back to sleep. Right? So uh, uh, we shouldn't take this too far, but you see the point. I rather like a third way of thinking about performances which is that um, I'm on and I'm sharing something. I say, look, I have this story. I want to share it with you. Here it is. What do you think? Right? This is a performance. Right? That the thing is I tell stories. It's a narrative way of thinking about how stories are being told. Right? And I would submit to you that that is what states do during crises. Why do they do it? Because they have to demonstrate that they're in charge. If someone is not in charge, then someone else will be in charge, right? Uh, if you don't perpetually demonstrate that you're in charge, someone else will step in. Let's say if you don't demonstrate your world hegemony in when the crisis breaks in Syria, for example, and you don't do anything because you have a doctrine, the so-called Obama doctrine, which verbatim went like this, don't do stupid shit, unquote. Uh, and you do nothing, then someone else will come and do it for you. Right? In this case, Russia. Right? That's what happens if you don't do anything. 
And that goes for states at, as her, at home as well. Sovereignty has to be lived, right? And talks about, uh, about uh, sort of uh, upholding sovereignty, right? If you let infringements go by, well, you have a problem. And uh, I don't know about the Austrian case. My guess would be that it's the same as the Norwegian case, that every week, maybe sometimes in periods every day, you would have planes going up in order to demonstrate that other planes, fighter planes, can't cross your territory. So there's a game going on, a practice. that You demonstrate that you're in charge of your sovereign territory by sending up fighter planes. Right? Norway, contrary to this state, is a coastal state, so we do the same with ships. Right? And uh, so when there is a crisis, for example, in 2005, uh, a Russian fishing vessel came into Norwegian ter ter territorial waters and uh, was boarded by uh, Norwegian inspectors. And the, Russians, the Russian boat responded by going to, to Blue Sea and uh, heading for a Russian port because it has fished, fished too much. So two Norwegian officials were abducted by a Russian fishing vessel. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is the sort of stuff that can become a security crisis if you don't act. What did the state do? Boom! You know, big spiel, you know. Our citizens have been taken into... You wouldn't have expected that, because Norway is a small country. Russia is a rather larger country. Uh, there would have been other ways of doing it, you know, taking it easy, sort of... That happened as well. But it was very important to the Norwegian state to really blow the trumpet on this one. Right? Why was that? Because if they hadn't done so, it would have been a sign that, that the Norwegian sovereignty was up for grabs. The territorial integrity and the uh, movement of the officers that were charged with up upholding it was not respected. So the performance the state put on was one of sort of uh, urgency and with good reason. That is what happens when there are security crises, right? This has to stop, you know, we have to s defend ourselves, we have to defend our territory, etc. Now, with civilian crisis, it's very different, because there the state, the Norwegian state, and anecdotally, Scandinavian states, are very interesting to hear about the Austrian state in the Q&A, the other state is sort of very cool, acting cool and competent. You know, we will fix this. You know, we will get these people back. You know, voice goes down. Oh, we will take care of this. Right? Mm -hmm. Very tough. You know? um, it's just a rather different thing. Right? And, in humanit and, and the addressee of the, what is being said would also be another one. Uh, it would be the, no the Norwegian citizenry as such few other people would be addressed, right? Whereas if it's a security crisis, the addressee will be the Norwegian uh, citizenry, but it will also be the st other states involved in the security crisis. So the difference is in, in targeted audiences, audiences. If you have more than one audience that you're speaking to, we call it multiple signaling, right? And that's always interesting because you don't necessarily want to send the same message to all the audiences you speak to, right? Uh, everybody who follows his or her own life knows that. Mm -hmm. uh, we do it all the time. Right? We uh, want to tell the professor that we haven't done our homework, but we want to do it in a way so that the rest of the class will not lose our respect for being growling, right? So we have to sort of speak in a way that will target both audiences. Does this ring a bell? No, of course, you've never heard about such a thing. That was just when I was a student, right? Um, and the same with, with, uh, with civilian crisis and, and, and security crisis. And the same, and rather different, with humanitarian crises. There it's the sort of uh, do-gooder. Of course Norway is doing everything it can to help. Who are the addressees here? Is it the people who are actually in crisis? The, the ones who need humanitarian relief? No. It's a performance that we are a good state, right? we are doing good in the world. There's a difference there. Right? Um, 
I could also go into further differences between these th three crises, but maybe we should sort of save that a bit for the Q&A. Um, I think I've, uh, I've, I've gotten across the, uh, the major point, which is that uh, contrary to what we often think, uh, a crisis is not necessarily all bad news to a state because it's also a chance to perform and shine, to remind people why it is necessary to have it. And let me end by, by telling you, sort of on a personal note, I have been spending time over the last 15 years trying to uh, argue for the Norwegian Foreign Ministry getting rid of everything that has to do with consular services and go back to how it was in the world in every single country before 1906, namely that the consular service and the diplomatic service were organized as two different things. Why have I done that? Because consular services have become the, easily, can easily become the tail that wags the dog. There's a hell of a lot of cultural work uh, being done. There's a lot of consular work of all different stripes being done so that it would be very good for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to put that like any other ministry would do, put that to source it out and put it in the directory that they could then st sort of steer as a ministry. That's how it's done in any other sort of walk of, 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 of state life. I haven't met a single diplomat who, like, who likes this idea. And why is that? It is because this is the one way in which the foreign ministry can interact and demonstrate to Norwegian citizens that they are needed by the citizenry. Right? So they don't want to get rid of this work because it's a chance to shine. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly rational. I just don't think that it's optimal, but as seen from the MFA, it's perfectly rational to hold on to it for legitimacy purposes. So, um, so the effects of these crises being different and being s handled differently and being used differently when it comes to legitimacy are tangible and real. And that was what I was supposed to demonstrate, I suppose. So uh, should we turn to the Q&A? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, many, many thanks for a great talk. Uh, I think there was a lot in there, and uh, feel free to ask any question that comes to your mind. Uh, so Eva, at the, at the beginning, he, I also thought about this term, the crisisation or whatever, yeah. But it's really the kind of times that we live in, right? So, so, um, so, so the term crisis is all over the place. Sometimes I think justified, sometimes less so, and um, and so there really is a lot, is a lot to talk about, and it's it's a, it's a very detailed. Um, account about what happens in a, in, a, in a foreign ministry and we can get into the question also how it looks like in, 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 in Austria for instance to what extent that's similar to what extent is different that I think there are a lot of similarities um, but let me hand over the, the word to you and uh, Eva if you allow we're going to pack uh, we're going to do sets of questions because okay. they're usually mm -hmm. quite an active bunch uh, so well, let's let's try with uh, with three questions at the at the beginning. Maybe identify yourself quickly and then and then ask. Yes. Mm -hmm. We well, always need the, the microphone, Sandra. So it's in the in the back. Yeah. That is one big microphone. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's corona-proof, you know? Oh, yes, right. <laughs> From afar. It's more like Hello. a double-handed Hello, Dr. Thing. <laughs> Thank you for such an uh, insightful presentation. I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit on the key differences between humanitarian and civilian crisis mm -hmm. and what those would be, especially the civilian ones. Thank you. I'm going to have another. Uh, just to make it easy for Sandra, so in the back again, yeah. Thank you very much for such a great presentation. Um, I just wonder, what if a, a particular crisis combines all three conditions you, oh, you mentioned? Humanitarian, civilian, and security reasons. So is the way of dealing with this kind of conflict different from any other? Thank you. Is there one more question just uh, about the categorization of the, of the, th the three types of crisis? Because then we could follow up straight away. Otherwise, feel free to ask another one. Uh, to, then, then uh, again, to make it easy for you. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, so you were discussing the civilian and possible security crisis of the Norwegian and Russian vessels. I wanted to know how a state can decide how to react in that situation, because as you discussed, Norway wanted to come off strong and say, no, Russia, you can't do this. Um, but at the same time, they could have done the opposite and not respond, not, not, not respond, but not come off with that, because it's also showing almost a sign of weakness that this was able to happen. So how do states decide between you know, showing weakness that it was able to happen and on the opposite, trying to come off strong that, hey, it happened, but you can't do this again? Thank you. Then Eva, I can Thanks. Give you the word again. Nice questions. Um, the first one, the difference between humanitarian crises and civilian crises would simply be, uh, are the ones who are in trouble Norwegian citizens or not? So a humanitarian crisis would, by definition, be a crisis concerning other citizen, other states' citizens. That's why it's only kicked into gear in the late 1800s, because states have always made a point of protecting their own citizens. They may not have done so in practice, but they have always insisted that they're actually doing it on principle. Right? So that's a clear-cut thing. Um, so a humanitarian crisis uh, will happen outside of the state's territory, and it, in, it will involve primarily and usually exclusively other citizens. So a typical example would be a, 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 a hunger disaster in the Horn of Africa or a, 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 an earthquake in Turkey, etc. That kind of thing. Right? Whereas a civilian crisis would be Norwegian citizens stuck abroad for, for different reasons. For example, uh, that is, you know, consular work. I mean, for example, if an Austrian citizen is imprisoned in uh, uh, Togo, then it would be the job of the... Um, um, I don't know whether, uh, um, whether Austria has an embassy or a consulate in Togo, but it would be the job of that entity to visit uh, that, that Austrian citizen in prison perhaps once a year to demonstrate that you're there. Right? Uh, a typical example of this would be, uh, in the Norwegian case, would be uh, a case where two Norwegian mercenaries in Congo murdered someone, were apprehended, and uh, imprisoned. And uh, uh, conditions in the prison were a bit suboptimal, as seen from the Norwegian uh, point of view. And the, uh, the, uh, the question of whether these, this person had actually been murdered or simply run over by a car was also unclear. So Norway spends quite a lot of, of effort on, uh, on getting these two people home. Right? One of them died in prison, but the, when, after five years, the second one, called Joshua French, came back to Norway. Uh, it happened, and this was super orchestrated by the Norwegian state, it happened on the National Day, which is the 17th of May, and a press conference was held that day by the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, no less, of Norway, to cash in on the fact that uh, and the, the prodigal son had been brought home, as it were, to put it in biblical terms. So that would be a civilian crisis for you. Uh, can the, uh, the, uh, the a, a, a crisis have all three? Yes, they can. Uh, for example, uh, so the tsunami was obviously a humanitarian crisis, if we think about it globally. People died like flies. Uh, it was also a, uh, a civilian crisis, as seen from... Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, etc. So possibly, I think, quite probably, Austria. Simply because citizens of those countries were missing or, or had problems locally and needed assistance. Uh, an example of all three. Uh, yes, I mean, if typically if a crisis escalates and becomes pervasive, they, it would have elements of all three types of crises about it. Yes. So... Uh, uh, this, the distinction is, it is tempting to say that the distinction is an analytical one, but it isn't, because it's, uh, we asked people in the 
within the foreign ministry, how they thought about what kind of crisis existed. They identified the three different ones, and when we checked how the setup was, they were three different phenomena on the ground because they were organized in different ways. So as seen from the Norwegian MFA, there are three different kinds of crises. Right? Analytically, we, we, we went with that as well, but we might also have gone with only there only being one type of crisis that would have different kinds of elements. Right? So uh, this is not, what I'm presenting here is not an analytical construct only. It also has hermeneutical value, practical value. I hope that answered the question. Um, security crisis, that is the question, isn't it? How do you handle a security crisis? I would like our host to chime in on this one because you, you've you researched it more than I have. But uh, again, if we follow uh, the Copenhagen School and the securitization uh, 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 paradigm, uh, we see that there is, a, there, is a, there is a choice all the way here. right? You can take a tiny little thing, you can dress your own soldiers up in wrong uniforms and send them across the border and tape them back again and say, gee, you know, we're being invaded by a foreign country. That's a real life example, by the way. Uh, and it's happened more than once and more, in, in more than only one place. But it was a nice little tactics by certain states in the 1930s, for example. Um, you could do that. Or the other extreme is Denmark during the Second World War. On the uh, 8th of April, 1940, Nazi Germany invaded Denmark. Lots of different troop movements and forces coming in. Not a shot was fired. Denmark decided that its sovereignty hadn't been infringed, so there was no crisis. That is a nice one, right? There was no talk about performing the crisis. And why did this happen? Very simple, because they knew that they didn't stand a chance. Anyone who's a parent knows that uh, you don't call a crisis if you know you can't win, right? Uh, this becomes more and more of a problem the older the kids becomes, actually. I have seven of them, and I know. Uh -huh. So uh, there comes a point where you know that, no, you don't confront, because you know you will lose. So you, know, you don't make a crisis if you don't think that you can get anything out of it. It's that simple. So, but the question you ask is, of course, goes to the heart of, of, in, of international relations in general. So there is no sort of general answer, of course, but uh, I hope these doodles will partly answer the question. Thanks a lot. And we have time for more questions. Just every, so that I get a, an idea, so there are lots of hands up. So I'm go, even going to do five in a, in, a, in a batch now, okay? Let's just do one, two, three, four, five. Somebody can start with Michelangelo, and then the rest is in the, oh, yeah. Um, hello, yeah, thank you for your presentation. My name is Aaron. Um, thank you for taking off your mask. <laughs> it's, very, it's very sort of, uh, there is a certain verfremdung here, we're looking at sort of all these, these yes. sort of non-faces, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, m because uh, you talked about uh, communication and audiences, I was wondering if during um, your investigation did you find that um, crises were communicated differently within the foreign ministry and then outside? This is about the, the performative act of, of communicating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the severity of a, of a crisis. Thank you. Thank you. And we can just go down the line. Thank you again. Uh, my question, I think it's a follow-up to Aaron's. How much can we really change our narrative according to the intended audiences that we have? I mean, if we make really big changes of our narrative, aren't we uh, uh, assumingly illegitimate to begin with? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Fatini, and my question has to do with whether this message that the states are going are trying to, to pass through when they are um, responding to a crisis can also have an unintentional and unconscious side. So can we have an unintentional signaling with, uh, through the response to a crisis? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for today's discussion. Uh, my question has to do with uh, what you said about multifaceted signaling and the exaggeration of some uh, reactions to certain states. What happens when um, a state has to show a very, let's say, indirect 
reaction to a crisis that is happening internally, let's say, mass protests that have led to uh, riots, for instance, and uh, just one last categorical question. Where exactly do you classify uh, economic crises mm -hmm. in this scenario? Thank you so much. Thank you. And then there's one last one in that part. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, since a few decades, especially in Western countries, there's been a tendency for states to outsource a lot of their activities to the private sector. Mm -hmm. Thinking, for example, of consular services, which you've mentioned, but also in crises, I think of the COVID crises, the sort of uh, loads of um, big consultancy companies do a lot, doing a lot of work on behalf of states, but even vaccines being produced, delivered by private companies, and so on. What does this, what effect does it have on this perform, performance, performativity that you're talking about? Does it diminish this, uh, this sort of impression of sovereignty that a state wants to sort of project? Or does it not have a big impact because these companies are seen as an extension of uh, the state? Now, that's my question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to you again. Thank you. Um, Performance of, of, of crisis in and out of the foreign ministry? Well, inside the foreign ministry, uh, people make a point of keeping calm and carrying on. I mean, a good diplomat is never hot under the collar. I mean, there are diplomats that, that perform rage. Richard Holbrook comes to mind. Uh, but he always keeps cool on the inside. Right? Uh, Otherwise, people are bad diplomats. Um, so, uh, I will give you an example. Um, in 2004, I was working in the ministry, and uh, there was a crisis concerning a group of Vietnamese boat people who were on board a Norwegian ship, and Aust Australia denied that ship the right to go to shore and lift off people in distress. And as seen from the Sea Nation Norway, this was an absolutely impossible thing to do, because peop if people are uh, in trouble at sea, you pick them up regardless. You know? uh, if ever there is a situation in my country where this uh, adage that here is neither Greek nor Gentile, uh, man nor woman, uh, uh, rich nor poor, it is when you find someone who is in trouble at sea. You fish them on board, and that's it. I mean, you can hate their guts, you take them to shore. You, know? you don't necessarily give them a blanket, but you take them to shore. Right? Um, and that Australia didn't do that. They just sent them to Nauru, you know, which is a sort of a tiny little, little island state offshore. And there was a crisis. Uh, uh, Norwegians were sort of, I mean, this was like, I don't know what the Australian equivalent would be, but to, to us it was simply incomprehensible. I mean, people, at s people in distress at sea should have help, period. But the MFA said not a word, but inside there was rage at the Australians. And we have always had super good relations with Australians. I mean, this was something ter t totally new. So the crisis was performed as a t on, a, on a personal level inside the ministry. There was sort of... I mean, incomprehension, and I, I would not, rage is maybe too strong, but anger. Uh, whereas outside, not a word was spoken. Well, almost not a word. So, uh, so it's a job of the MFA to keep calm and carry on and not do anything else than sending a sort of specific message, usually through and increasingly through one sort of unit, namely the communications unit which is interestingly, as more and more mediatized realities have, have emerged, the more important the communication center has become. And therefore it's moved into the, the center of the ministries. So whereas before they were, were at the fringe, they're now usually part of the secretariats of the foreign minister, right? Is it like that in Austria as well? The, uh, yeah, I'm not probably sure. is. Right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the answer is yes, there's a difference there. Question two. Um, how multiple can signaling be before it all goes to hell? Well, that is the question, isn't it? Um, and, um, and there was a period where tr Trump was able to, uh, to, uh, to give multiple signaling in his early speeches where he had certain code phrases 
that were targeted to certain evangelical Christian groups, then he always caught at it and he had to stop doing that. But as long as you can get away with it, people do it. Well, but this is getting harder and harder. And I think the, the key example in the uh, literature is uh, the Danish Muhammad cartoon crisis, where a local Danish newspaper with hardly any circulation uh, published cartoons of the Prophet. And two weeks later, people were born burning uh, Danish embassies in the Middle East, in, in a number of places in the Middle East. So, uh, so uh, it, it's becoming harder to get away with multiple signaling. But uh, since we can do it in conversation with when we have two friends in the room, I suppose it will never die off completely. Right? Um, unintended consequences, the answer is yes. I don't have much more to say about that. Everything in human life can have unintended consequences, and it does. Right? Uh, our rationality, by this, as Herbert Simon put it already in 1959, our rationality is necessarily bounded. We don't know how things will go down, and therefore sort of interesting things will happen. And that's just... In, in I, I will come right down the middle here and say that this is a part of the human condition. I, my God, I mean, it happens almost every week that I say something to my wife of 17 years, and it has consequences that I was nowhere near understanding. You know? And if that's the case, then how should it be different when you should, should, should signal on a state level? Right? Um, um, economic crisis. The reason for that is that we don't know much about it. I mean, if you start researching things you don't know much about, you're not particularly smart. So uh, we've stayed away from that. I mean, there are large literatures on economic crises. We don't know it well, so we didn't research it. And uh, uh, then you can come right back and say, but if the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had said that, the, that they themselves thought about economic crisis as a, as a big thing we would have had to because we started from what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs thought was important and the real, not what we thought was important and real, but thank God they didn't. <laughs> so the problem didn't arise. Should someone look at this? Absolutely. I dare you. Mm -hmm. um, deniability uh, is the answer to, a uh, part answer to the last question about... Um, about um, what, the, what, what, sort of what are the consequences of leasing out more and more of state stuff and working through NGOs and international organizations. I gave you an example of humanitarian crisis where this is being done and it does not infringe on Norway's, the Norwegian state's uh, ability to use it. So that's the case where this is the case. But the another case would be the US and uh, the use of contractors where they have this expression, and uh, if there is a person in the room that can, uh, can come up with the, direct, with the correct expression, please help me, but it's called something like uh, inalienable governmental co uh, um, issues. Or something. I mean, I mean they've, they've decided that there are certain issues that the state must do, and it's the state and only the state. For example, pushing the button on drones when someone is supposed to die, that cannot be contracted out. Um, but the question is an empirical one, because in certain cases, the state wants deniability. So it leases out stuff so that it cannot be traced back to the state, so the state can wash its hands. Right? Um, so there's a pilot effect here. Um, on the other hand, it is, of course, very nice when something good happens that it, the state can take. You know. and, uh, an example, um, there was a civilian crisis uh, that was a bit fishy uh, some years ago where a uh, Moroccan sports star and uh, known personality in Morocco married a Norwegian woman. Uh, they settled in Norway, had two kids, uh, according to her, he was violent. And one fine day, he took off from Morocco with the two kids. And the woman was able to muster state... Uh, well, she was able to muster help to get those two kids out, and there were Norwegian military involved. 
But the Norwegian state insists that it had nothing to do with it. Because the military personnel involved were on holiday. And I'm quite sure they were on holiday. Mm -hmm. This is what we call deniability, right? Um, and it happens all the time. So when do you go for deniability and when do you go for, for thin? well, when something's bad, you don't want it. When something's good, you want it. I mean, I think it's that simple. So it's an empirical question. Thank you, Eva. And uh, then I think we can do one last round of questions. Hands up, who still wants to ask? Then, uh, yes. Sandra, right the middle, the middle, yeah. Uh, first off, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to give this presentation. Uh, my question has to do uh, mostly with uh, state capacity and how the capacity, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of a particular state influences, uh, one, the way it performs in these crises, and two, the way it organizes to address these crises in a uh, more direct way. Uh, for example, the uh, sort of different approaches that a country like the United States, China, or Russia, the quote unquote great powers of the world would approach, were, as opposed to a medium or small power like, for example, Norway mm -hmm. or Morocco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it was next, yeah. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, so going back to your main argument that crisis can be positive in a way that it allows for countries an opportunity to basically show off. Um, does how I, I'm wondering how your argument applies to like different regime types because most of your examples were democratic regimes. Yes. And in more authoritarian regimes, I would assume uh, the government wouldn't be too worried about showing off as it would be to strengthening its grip on power. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then uh, Sandra, maybe we're gonna stay over there straight away. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. So my question is just about like the technology. You were mentioning that the communication department, specifically in Norway, has moved into the secretariat. Has this increase in tech and communication made <coughs> solving these crises easier? And also, has it made it easier to posture this positive sort of, oh, look, we're doing the best thing ever, because you're able to you know, post it on Instagram or what have you? Thanks. Thank you. And then, the, uh, then maybe we're going to continue with Luca, and then we're going to move over. Um, maybe not a comment, more a comment than a, than a question, but um, an actor in, in the state that also loves crisis and the time to shine is the media, the news media. Um, how would you maybe do the, the nexus between uh, uh, what the, the role that the state or the foreign ministry that wants the media to perform, and how does it want uh, the media to perform in any in a, in a type of crisis that you mentioned, and how does this maybe, um, how, how do these two work together or apart, or is there a certain, maybe even a, a sector of uh, uh, of the foreign ministry in, in Norway, which would then in the time of crisis literally um, only work with with the media apparatus to really steer the message to a certain extent? I, I didn't quite get that. Uh, um, I mean, if there, are, if there are spin doctors inside the MFA? No, the, surely, but um, in a sense of, yes, like how, um, how does this connection then, in, when, when a crisis arises, um, how does this connection to the, maybe the state media or the international media then function in, in, the, in, the, in the Norwegian foreign ministry? Like, is there a specific um, way of, of doing it, or is there, is there a mantra to doing it? There's, there's a model, the modus operandi, or is just, let it float, let it go. Mm. Um, mm. We trust the media fully to do their job honestly mm. well. They don't have no particular interest for having yeah, yeah. it, blah, 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 blah. Mm. Finally, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I would like to ask you, um, is, is it possible actually civilian crisis to lead to humani humanitarian crisis? And in this relation, I'm really happy that you mentioned Bulgaria because I'm from Bulgaria. And how you would assess uh, the civilian crisis that we had with, uh, with uh, the Libyo-Bulgarian crisis with the nurses? And actually, uh, because we had civilian crisis for a long time with them, and because Libya was breaching the fundamental rights of the nurses in the prison, was it actually humanitarian crisis evolved? Mm. Thank you. Thank you.
And last, last, last chance to ask a question, anyone? Okay, no, you were super active already anyway. Was there one more? No. Thank you. Eva. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't answer the last one because I don't know the details. So, uh, but uh, in principle, uh, if, uh, if a, I mean, let's take another example that I know more about, the Uyghur in, uh, in, uh, in, in China. They are Chinese citizens, um, and therefore it's not a civilian crisis as seen from China, because they are in the state, but of course a number of vo voices are pushing for making that into a humanitarian crisis. Right? Um, and uh, that would go for the, the number of different sort of, uh, of, of minorities of different sort, LBGT, you can go on, uh, would be a typical example as well. You now have court cases in a number of European countries, people coming from countries like Iran and looking for, for exile and giving us the reason that they will be tortured if they go back. Um, that would not be a humanitarian crisis because there are not too many people involved, but it would fall under humanitarian law so there would be certain similarities. But I'm out of my depth here, so I will just stop there. Right? Um, the question about capacity is super important. Uh, the area of validity, I mean, the area where this, these findings hold would be Norway, and we think tentatively Scandinavia, perhaps even like-minded countries, like the Netherlands, uh, uh, Canada, Australia. Um, but that's a typical scientific problem that if you, you start somewhere and if you want to widen and get coverage, ideally universal co coverage, more research has to be done. And it has to be done by people who know the countries in question. So we make no claims whatsoever for this to have an area of validity outside of Scandinavia and possibly like-minded countries. Um, there are two things that I want to remark on, th on this, um, generally. I mean, one thing is that great powers, by definition, has a, wider, uh, has a larger toolbox. To use an expression Charles Tilley made famous, they have a larger repertoire. Right? So it stands to reason that their, uh, their birth and leeway, uh, when the crises occur, will be grander. It also stands to reason that there will be differences between the great powers in how they think about crises. So this is the standard academic question to this kind of question, uh, answer to this kind of question. More work has to be done. Right? And that also goes for the, uh, for the, uh, the question of, uh, of different regime types. Um, quite obviously, this will be different for uh, authoritarian states because their constraints on them uh, will be different and their leeway will be different. So, uh, so a number of crises will not be remarked on at all. And when a crisis will be defined as a crisis, other things will be done. I'll give you an example. Uh, Russia, uh, you, in the 90s, you had a couple of crises. and the 2000s, you had a couple of crises where the state made a point of storming in, although they knew that a number of hostages in hostage situations would die. There was a case in Beslan, in a, sort of a, in a school situation. And there was a case in a theater in Moscow. And this, I have a hard time seeing a Scandinavian country doing it that way, storming in by military personnel. But in Russia, this was fairly popular because the state demonstrated that it could act. When, when it's put in mind of Mao's adage that one cannot make a revolution, I mean, cannot make an omelette without breaking eggs. So yes, thinking will be different and practices will be different. Um, Technology, uh, will this be easier uh, because of technology? Yes, it will be much easier to fix. Um, it will come as a shock to a number of persons in this room, but uh, there were times when there was no such thing as a mobile phone. Uh, and uh, how did you call home when you were abroad? That was a big, big, big problem, and it costs a lot of money. And you can take it from me, because I was there. Um, so the answer is a resounding yes on the technology front. Uh, does it make it easier to perform well? Uh, en principe, yes. Uh, 
you have social media, you can Twitter, you can, uh, you can tweet, you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can post, you can do all these things. But remember the, uh, uh, the Muhammad cartoon crisis. It could go bo both ways. I think it's, there's an amplification effect from the media here that can go both ways. So it could be better, but it could also be worse. So, uh, so in, it inten the new media intensifies the situation, I think, more than actually sort of, sort of biasing in a, in a negative or positive uh, uh, direction. But that's just like my opinion, dude. Um, the, uh, uh, the last question was about how the MFA handles the media. Uh, it goes for all, and again, area of validity here, all democratic regimes that ministries of foreign affairs have spent more and more time on handling the media over the years. Uh, there's a top meeting in the Norwegian MFA every day with uh, the foreign minister, the, uh, the secretary general, and most of the heads of department, and of course the communication. Uh, and most of those meetings, most time, every day, would be about how to handle the media. And uh, I don't have time to go into the relationship between a ministry and a media in general here, but of course the key thing is that it's a reciprocal relationship. The MFA depends on the media to get stuff out, but the media depends on good working relations with the MFA to get the inform information. So they have something to actually put up there. So if you look at this over time, if, uh, if one medium actually does something stupid, they may find that information dries up. I don't have an example from Norway, but I have an example from Britain. During Maggie Thatcher's uh, elated period, years of, of, of rule, um, uh, she made it a habit of actually not sort of inviting uh, certain newspapers that were critical to press briefings. And uh, wasn't it Steve Bannon who pointed to the press at one occasion and said, there sits the opposition. So, um, so uh, these practices are multifarious, I suppose is the word here, um, and, uh, and uh, need specific attention. But, um, and of course, again, it looks very different if you look at non-democratic regimes. So the question is simply too, bi too big. Mm -hmm. There's an entire discipline, media studies, that looks at this. So uh, I think I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. No, Eva, thank you so much. It um, was a really great talk. I learned a lot myself, too. And uh, if you want to continue the conversation in more informal fashion, we're going to open that door over there. We're going to have a little reception uh, next door. And uh, thanks a lot for your questions. And yeah, and I'm looking forward to the informal part over there. Eva, uh, thanks a lot for your talk again. I think really you deserve a <laughs> massive round of applause.